Um, today we have Susan Clark visiting us from Columbia University, where she is completing her PhD. Uh, she did her bachelor's degree at the University of North Carolina. Um, and she's talking about a lot of interesting magnetic phenomena. Um, she's around for the week, she's around all day tomorrow, and Friday most of the day, half the day. Whole day. The whole day. Yeah. So if you want to talk to her, she'll be around. Um, please, go ahead. All right. Thank you. Um, and this is work that I've done with my collaborators, Colin Hill, my thesis advisors, Josh Peake and Mary Putman, and also Jeff Oishi. Um, so today I'm going to talk about two very different uh, sort of problems in magnetism. The first are the foregrounds that obscure our view of early universe phenomena. And the second is the saturation of the magnetorotational instability. So for each of these, I'll take you through first sort of what the big overarching question is that people are trying to answer, and then delve into what the sort of unusual approach that I have taken in my research to each of these problems are. So the first um, is polarized CMB foregrounds. And the overarching question here is pretty simple. We're trying to answer, is inflation correct? Meaning that if we look at our current picture of the history of the universe, so this is showing the size scale of the universe from the moment of the Big Bang until the present day, we have this theory of inflation that states that in the first fraction of a second after the universe popped into existence, it underwent a period of extremely rapid expansion. And we have tons of evidence uh, for why we believe that inflation happened, but it's all circumstantial evidence. So what we really are looking for is a direct signature of inflation. And we have something to look for because gravitational waves during this epoch of inflation should have imprinted a polarization signal in the cosmic microwave background at the surface of last scattering. So this is what we call B-mode polarization or primordial B-mode polarization. So the fact that these B-modes theoretically exist is the good news, right? Because we have something to look for. But the bad news is that a B-mode signal can also be, or is also created, by dust in our own galaxy. And so we're probably all well aware by now that we have not yet detected B-modes because dust in our galaxy is what we detect anytime we try and measure this polarization in the cosmic microwave background. So we know by now that the, any successful detection of B-modes will require characterizing and then subtracting the polarized dust foreground. So why does dust produce a polarization pattern at all? Well, the Milky Way is, of course, a very dusty place. And uh, these dust grains are all sort of shapes and sizes and everywhere. But one thing that they're generally not is perfectly spherical. So these grains align their short axis with the ambient magnetic field. And then they re-radiate light that they absorb as partially polarized. So the dust emission that we then eventually detect is polarized in a direction orthogonal to the local magnetic field. And recently, the Planck satellite mapped this polarized dust emission on the full sky. So this is emission at 353 gigahertz, which is a wavelength dominated by dust. And uh, the colors in this image are just dust intensity. But then you also see these beautiful swirls uh, of sort of light and dark streaks. And that is showing you the 90 degree rotated dust polarization angle or the implied magnetic field direction as seen by Planck in this polarized dust. So this is a beautiful and exciting data set. This is extremely useful already for studying uh, polarization in the interstellar medium as well as for subtracting that ISM signal to see what's behind it, to see what's in the CMB. But our approach to dust polarization um, is not to use dust at all. So I'll talk today instead about neutral hydrogen, about H1. Uh, this is data from the 
Galactic Arecibo L-band feed array Galpha H1 survey uh, with Arecibo, which is the largest radio telescope in the world, at least for now. Um, so you're panning across the sky right now, everything that you can see, thank you, everything that you can see with Arecibo, and you're also moving back and forth in velocity space. So the red, green, and blue channels that make up this image are um, just moving along the velocity of the H1 line. And what you can see is that the diffuse ISM, this diffuse neutral hydrogen, is full of all of this intricate structure. And a lot of it appears extremely linear. It's sort of as if someone combed out the interstellar medium in places. So the question that we wanted to ask was whether these linear features in neutral hydrogen trace the orientation of the interstellar magnetic field. Because if they do, and we have some way of accurately measuring the orientation of the H1 structures, this means that we have an independent constraint on the polarization angle as measured by Planck, right? And that means that we could use this additional data to better constrain what the polarized dust foreground is. So our absolutely overarching question is, is inflation correct? But our contribution to this is to measure polarized foregrounds using the orientation of neutral hydrogen in the ISM. And we're asking this question specifically at high galactic latitudes. So I'll show you plots later, and they are this region of sky. It's just a, a strip of our Arecibo data that starts at 30 degrees off the plane and goes almost to galactic zenith. And you can see in this three color image that particularly at these highest galactic latitudes are where everything is very striated, very linear, when you just look by eye at the H1. But to ask these questions, we need some way of determining what the orientation of H1 structures is. And so our answer to this is called the Rolling Huff Transform, or the RHT for short. Um, this is a machine algorithm vision that uh, we developed. This is published and public, so you can go to my GitHub and use it for yourself. Um, it builds off of the earlier Huff Transform, which was actually originally developed to detect lines in a bubble chamber images. But I'll just briefly explain how the RHT works. So we want this transform to be sensitive to linearity in the data. That's what we're trying to detect, right? And not necessarily biased toward overdensities in the gas. So we unsharp mask our data by subtracting a smoothed version of the data. And then we threshold at zero to obtain a bit mask. So in the final panel of this cartoon, the black represents ones and the white represents zeros. So you can feed any sort of image data into the RHT, but what you're really ultimately operating on are ones and zeros. And then we step or roll through the image, uh, selecting a circular region centered on each pixel in turn. So this is sort of the rolling part of the transform. And uh, with some window, we uh, isolate this window. And then for every possible line that passes through the center of this circular window, we calculate the fraction of the pixels that are lit in the bit mask. So we're mapping in this cartoon. We're sort of sweeping out that blue theta line and mapping onto this. So as you pass that yellow dotted line in the cartoon, you get this spike, you pass some other things, get a smaller spike. And then we retain only the, uh, only the data that's above some given fraction. So we say, OK, everything 70%, everything has to be at least 70% of this possible line for us to record the data. We don't just record everything just because it would be far too much. 
Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, and that also helps deal with uh, noisy or fragmented data where you want to detect something even if it, you have a little bit of noise in the middle of it. Um, and so, so the data in this cartoon that we would retain for this center pixel is this pink line. So it ends up being power as a function of theta for each of these center pixels. This, this is a constraint of a V-band uh, choice, velocity band choice. Or That's right. So you can, you can do this. You have to operate on two-dimensional data, but you can do this velocity slice by velocity slice to preserve that information. And what's the width of the velocity slice? Typically. We're using three kilometers per second for this, although we find we're not terribly sensitive to that. So as long as you don't bend so finely in velocity that you don't see uh, these features by eye, or so broadly in velocity that everything gets sort of blobby and you're probably compacting features together. And the movie you showed, mm -hmm. very beautiful, um, that was all projected. There wasn't any uh, uh, velocity slice. You're actually moving in velocity oh, space. So you're seeing velocity. only a so little bit of velocity at a time. So, so I see. So it was uh, the sort of depth right. is velocity, yes. But, uh, what I'm getting at is um, do you see clear separations of high velocity clouds from low velocity clouds? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. Here we're focused um, narrowly enough that we're not looking at, we're intentionally excluding high velocity clouds from this. Um, but in, in the Galpha data in general. Well, we'll have to look at them soon. But yeah. Um, but certainly in the Galpha data, there's very prominent high velocity clouds. So, so the end result is this, right? You've mapped two image dimensions to three, where now you have intensity as a function of angle for every image pixel. And from this, we define some Q and U, QRHT and URHT Stokes parameters. Um, so, and as I just mentioned, we are binning in three kilometer per second chunks. And we're doing this from about minus to plus 15 kilometers per second. Um, although, we're, again, we're not incredibly sensitive to that. This is just sort of what was the cleanest data when I began this project. Um, and so we do this for each velocity slice and then add up all the Qs and add up all the Us. Uh, couldn't you have done this without those lines? Without which lines? So this is just a transform of, uh, of the angular information on that scale. Right? So you've made these uh, uh, pseudo Q and U quantities mm -hmm. from the intensity data. So you don't really. I guess that uh, maybe you didn't actually use that, but I have been worried that the linear, it looked like you were enforcing some linearity in the fits, which, because everything is bent, is not a good approximation. Well, this, this will take into account, so yeah, this is a cartoon where there's a, everything is at exactly one angle, right? But in reality, it doesn't look like this. There's some distribution of gas at some angle for every so, feature. So Q here has the center, but it's got the aperture scale. That's, it's, so it's a function of aperture scale. And it's really like a, um, an image of, uh, of this modified Q and U, smooth on that scale. Um, yes. I, I, I guess what I'm trying to say is you probably could have, and maybe you did, you can just work on the maps themselves without, except you did do an aperture. Oh, I see what you mean by yeah, selecting I mean, a circular window? What you're doing is you're creating a smooth uh, filter scale, and you're doing yes, that's annulus true. averages. That is true, yeah. And um, you aren't using the radio information within the aperture is like it's that's right. Technology. That's right. So there is some scale sort of input into this. Um, we did vary that, and we find that everything I'm showing you today is not very sensitive to that. So, um, but yeah, we can definitely talk more about that. So we have our Qs and Us, and what we've ultimately done, right, is defined some 
theta RHT, some measure of the orientation of H1 for every pixel or every smooth pixel or whatever scale you want to look at in the image we began with. And so we can then compare that to theta 353, which is going to be the uh, implied magnetic field orientation as, as measured by Planck in the dust polarization. And the punchline here is that the H1 orientation traces the Planck polarization angle extremely well. So um, I encourage you to look at this in the paper um, where it's perhaps more beautiful, but this is a line integral convolution image. So I've taken the orientation vectors from the 353 gigahertz angles on the bottom and from the H1 RHT orientation on the top and convolved those angles with a noise field. So these uh, lines that you, you can sort of see are um, showing you the orientation of the magnetic field as measured by Planck and the orientation of the H1 as measured with this RHT. And then there are also some overlaid pseudo vectors showing you starlight polarization orientation in this field. And, yes? So it tells you orientation. Does it tell you any information about a strength? Uh, no. Yes. So everything I am showing you today is just orientation. Um, and the colors in the back are just densi density tracers. So column density of H1 on the top and 353 gigahertz opacity on the bottom. Yeah. So, uh, yes. Sorry if this is what you're about to say anyway, but um, can, you, can you quantify the degree to which they resemble each other and do that as a function of position? Why, yes, you can. Uh, <laughs> um, it's actually not this slide, but we'll get there. Um, here I'm just showing a, a histogram of the difference between these angles. So this is showing um, the difference where the Q and U maps used to create these uh, angles have been smoothed to 30 arc minutes, 15 arc minutes, and five arc minutes. And you can see that as you successively smooth, the Planck angles and the H1 angles are tracing one another better. Um, so that smoothing is different from changing the aperture of your Exactly, yes, yes. This is afterward. Um, and so what this is all telling us from an ISM perspective is that the structure of the cold neutral medium, which is what this H1 data is tracing, is more tightly coupled to the interstellar magnetic field than we previously realized. <coughs> Um, but from a CMB perspective, this is also um, potentially very useful and the reason becomes a little more clear when we focus on the highest galactic latitudes. So this is the same figure as before, but for everything only uh, at a galactic latitude of greater than 70 degrees. So you can see here that the plot of the 353 gigahertz angles looks a little crazy. It doesn't look very similar by eye. Um, to theta RHT, and that's because even with a one degree smoothing that I've used to make these images, the Planck data are noise dominated at the highest galactic latitudes. So if you're looking for B modes, you want to be pointing your telescope at high galactic latitudes because there's not as much dust, so there's not as much foreground contamination. But this is why we have a bit of a trade-off because the areas with the weakest foreground contamination are also the areas where we have the weakest foreground constraints from Planck, right? And so this is an area we think where using additional H1 information could be beneficial because this method of using H1 orientation to trace the orientation of the magnetic field works extremely well at high galactic latitude. So this is a plot of just the uh, normalized average polarization angle uncertainty for 353 gigahertz angles and theta RHT on the bottom. Um, and you can see that as you move to the highest galactic latitudes, the uncertainty in the H1 angle remains fairly constant, whereas of course it rises sharply in the Planck data. And I won't go into this too much, but we uh, cross-correlate between uh, the Planck data 
the RH2 orientation and also starlight polarization data that we have for this area of sky and we detect extremely strong cross correlations between all three of these. Um, we also, although we're not modeling the uh, polariza polarized intensity, so you have to interpret this a little cautiously, we also reproduce the EB asymmetry that's seen in the um, Planck data. And so um, what this is all indicating is that we can use H1 data, especially or at least in the highest latitude regions of sky to create higher signal to noise foreground CMB maps by combining this H1 orientation data with Planck data or other measurements of the polarized foreground. So what we're actually trying to determine is what is the most likely polarization fraction and polarization angle and intensity, or I and Q and U, um, given the Planck measurements and also the orientation of this H1. And so what I have started doing, what's next, um, is to input the orientation of the RHT, which is already power as a function of angle, right? Essentially use that as a probability, <coughs> as, a, <coughs> as a probability density function, um, and put that in as a prior on a likelihood constructed from the Planck measurements and the Planck uh, uncertainties. And when you then, so these are uh, likelihood prior posterior created in polarization fraction, polarization angle space. And you can then sample from a posterior in this space to create maps which have combined the information from both the H1 and the Planck data. So this is what I'm working on now. Um, and hopefully this should enable us to make higher signal to noise polarized foreground templates. And these are currently the limiting factor in the search for primordial B modes. So, we'll, s yes. So I, I have two questions, uh, I guess, at this point. Um, the first one, you said that the, the comparison to Planck indicates that the H1 structures are more aligned with the magnetic field than expected. That implies that maybe the theory here is lacking. So is there is it understood why these that these filaments should be aligned in this way? It's not understood why. I mean this is this is neutral hydrogen. So this interaction, I mean, this has to be coming about by coupling between the ions and the neutrals in the gas, right? Um, but no, there is not a well worked out theory of why you would expect this and why you would expect this to agree we see it. Dust that the polarized dust that you're seeing in Planck is basically located in the same structures as the neutral hydrogen because otherwise, obviously, you're biased because you could be sampling very different. Magnetic yes. Magnetic. So that is why we looked at high, or one of the reasons we looked at high latitude regions. Um, in the region that we're looking at, all of the gas and dust we think is basically all in the wall of the sort of local bubble that surrounds us, um, and so there really is only one. Thing along the line of sight. If you were to do this in the plane, that would be a huge problem. Uh, I haven't attempted that yet. But. So, so you see that, and you don't see that in the velocity structure, do you? See what in the velocity structure? That it's uh, a local problem. <coughs> um, you, you, you do see the local bubble in, the, in gas and dust. So Not you sure can, I understand the question. Uh, yeah, I guess you know that's a follow-up to the earlier question. Yeah. I asked. So um, you do separation according to the delta V, and uh, uh, I, I, I had understood that this was something that had been well explored by the groups that are doing this, um, which actually have more precision on this at some point. But the fact that you have the depth information is telling you something about the maybe the orientations in a three-dimensional direction. So right at the moment, you're dealing with the shells. Because we're looking at high latitudes, we can't use something like the H1 rotation curve of the galaxy to tell distance, unfortunately. Um, that you would have to be looking at lower latitude to do that, yeah. Yes. 
one decreases when you use a smaller aperture size. Is there a theoretical reason for that? So that wasn't actually the aperture size. That was the how much we smooth afterwards. So uh, we're smoothing both to a common resolution. Um, and as we smooth more, they agree more. So, yes? Uh, so uh, you uh, constructed the templates using cloud data and H1 data, right? Mm -hmm. So but, uh, it, uh, for future skin experiments, we expect to have a much higher resolution. Yes. So I, I wonder whether the template can be applicable when you go to small scale. Because we are using H1 data, it's last scale, right? But when you go to small scale clouds, Right. Well, this, so actually I should have mentioned this, H1 data is at a resolution of four arc minutes. So slightly better than the native Planck resolution. Of course, you have to smooth at these high latitudes, you have to smooth this Planck data significantly to get a high enough signal to noise to do anything. Um, so we're actually at a much better resolution than something like Planck. Other experiments, of course, ground-based experiments and whatever, will have uh, higher resolution. And so, um, yeah, I mean, we'll have to see if this, I expect that the usefulness of uh, H1 is probably going to peak very soon. And eventually, of course, we'll have far higher resolution of everything. And we'll have full frequency coverage and all of these things we'd like to have. We don't have it yet. Also, there's no reason if you're not looking over a huge area of sky that you need to use one of these uh, H1 surveys. right? You could make targeted, um, excuse me, targeted observations with of each one as well, yeah. So we'll see. Um, all right, so if it's all right, let us move to saturation of the MRI before I completely run out of time already. So the overarching question that we're asking here, and this work is with Jeff Oishi, um, who's now at Bates College in Maine, is how does the magnetorotational instability saturate? But I will step back for a second and explain what the MRI is and why we care about it. So we realized that the MRI is important astrophysically because basically accretion disks accrete. So many places in the universe we see disks of diffuse matter orbiting some central object and somehow that mass is transferred onto that central body. But the disk gas has too much angular momentum to be accreted directly and so we need some mechanism to transport angular momentum radially outward in accretion disks. And we know that that, or we've known for a long time that that basically needs to be some turbulent mechanism because uh, viscous coupling and a laminar flow is just woefully insufficient for creating this sort of angular momentum transfer that we need to form stars, for example. Uh, in fact, by some estimates, if we had to wait around for the laminar viscosity to form stars, none of them would have yet formed in the universe. So clearly we needed another and another turbulent mechanism for angular momentum transport and our answer to this since the early 90s has been the magnetorotational instability. And the very basic ingredients to drive this instability are you need hourly decreasing differential rotation and you need a weak mag vertical magnetic field. That's all. So you can understand this instability just very simply. If you have two little fluid elements uh, that are sort of tethered together along a field line and there's some initial displacement, your inner fluid element will start rotating faster than the outer one. You're differentially rotating because you're in a disk and so that displacement will increase. The magnetic tension which uh, the, the field line that is tethering these is acting like a spring or like a rubber band, um, will cause the inner element to slow, the outer element to speed up, and the transfer of angular momentum that results will increase the displacement and so on and so forth, you have yourself an instability. So this is the essence of the magnetorotational instability. And <coughs> It's simple enough to explain how the MRI grows, how the instability works, but it's considerably more difficult to understand how it saturates or shuts itself off. 
But this is an extremely important question astrophysically because what those saturation levels are uh, will set the angular momentum flux, will set the resulting magnetic field strength, um, and is key to understanding this instability generally. So this is an area of extremely rich study, and this is not at all doing it justice, but there are a lot of different explanations of how saturation might come about in different environments. Um, one idea is that you can modify the background shear, so you can uh, basically cut off the differential rotation, and it's the free energy from the differential rotation that allows the MRI to grow. You could also pour the free energy of the instability into generating magnetic fields until your magnetic field is strong enough to stabilize against the MRI so that little displacements would not cause that instability to grow. There's also a uh, whole sort of study of parasitic instabilities where in specific cases it might be actually secondary instabilities that grow off of MRI modes and feed on and destroy them. Um, I'll talk about that more in a second. So the big question here is how does the magnetorotational instability saturate? And our sort of unusual approach to answering this is using a technique called weakly nonlinear analysis. And I call this an unusual approach because almost everything, or at least the vast majority of what we know about MRI saturation at this point is from simulation. So, this is uh, some data from guessing there are 2012 showing the radial magnetic field density as a function of time. Excuse me. Um, and you can see that the evolution of the MRI is characterized by a period of linear growth followed by nonlinear saturation. Um, and of course, many of us, when we think nonlinear, we think simulation. But this will be actually an analytic study in the weakly nonlinear regime. So this is where the linear growth phase of the MRI just begins to give way to the nonlinear saturation. So studying the MRI in general is a practice in taking this incredibly complicated physical system uh, and approximating it into something much more tractable. And so in simulation, this often means working in some sort of local approximation. And there's also a considerable experimental effort being put forth right now to try and detect MRI in a laboratory setting. So this would be uh, theoretically very possible um, and very awesome if we could do it, but no one's yet actually detected MRI. And so what you do in a laboratory setting is, uh, of course, you can't actually have an accretion disk sitting in your lab, so you take uh, what's called a taylor coet setup. Two rotating cylinders. You rotate the inner one faster than the outer one to create some differential rotation. You fill that thing with some liquid metal, uh, liquid gallium or something like that, and then run a magnetic field through it. So this is from the Princeton Plasma Physics Laboratory, their MRI experimental setup. Um, and when we talk about the MRI, and especially MRI saturation in simulation, it's important to remember that we're often talking about uh, what we call a shearing box geometry. So um, it is currently sort of out of reach to simulate at the resolutions we need and with all the microphysics we need uh, a global simulation of the MRI, or at least MRI saturation. Um, in many, many contexts. So what we do instead is take a, a box, call it a shearing box, that is meant to represent a sort of chunk of your disk and has shear periodic boundary conditions. So this box is inherently local. There are no boundary effect um, uh, issues or no boundary effects at all. So the MRI is a local instability. So this is, of course, going to reproduce faithfully many aspects of MRI growth. Um, but it is probably not uh, capturing everything that is um, pertinent to MRI saturation in other contexts because of this locality. And so one sort of quirk 
of the MRI when you place it in a box and give it shear periodic boundary conditions is that the linear solutions to the MRI equations also happen to be exact solutions of the nonlinear MRI equations, which means that you have what we call channel modes that just sort of grow without bound. And that is where this whole analytic theory has been developed of parasitic modes. Kelvin Helmholtz instabilities um, and other instabilities which actually grow off of these primary MRI modes and destroy them and prevent total runaway growth and enable saturation. So when you see a, a shearing box simulation which has saturated, this is probably the mechanism by which it's saturating, these parasitic instabilities. But these channel modes don't exist in any sort of global context. This is not the way that saturation is occurring in a liquid metal for experiment, for example, um, and probably not in an astrophysical disk, at least in some parts of it. So we are analyzing a setup that's more relevant to one of these liquid metal experiments. We are using a taylor Coet setup. And uh, a pro an approximation we are making is that we have periodic vertical boundary conditions. So we are basically simulating in an infinitely long taylor Coet cylinder. We have no slip and perfectly conducting boundary conditions in the radial dimension. So those are more realistic. Um, and we are perturbing axisymmetrically, so the domain that we are studying the MRI on is this black box here, this uh, radial vertical dimension. So requisite equations, we're solving non-ideal, incompressible MRI equations in this axisymmetric taylor coet flow. And um, so the standard MRI is the MRI that is excited by that very basic recipe that I mentioned before, some vertical magnetic field and some differential rotation. And lots of analytic studies study this in what's called the thin gap regime, where you make this further approximation to say, OK, my MRI is taking place between two rotating cylinders or in a disk or what have you, but I'm going to say that that channel is extremely narrow, so narrow that I can approximate it as Cartesian. And all of the sort of curvature terms that would describe something like a disk drop out. So the thin gap approximation um, is a popular approximation that people use for the standard MRI. We conduct weekly nonlinear analysis on the thin gap and also on the Y gap or just standard Taylor Collette flow which is significantly more mathematically complicated, but otherwise essentially the same. And then we also look at a case where instead of just initializing an axial magnetic field, we also include some azimuthal component of the magnetic field, uh, of the background magnetic field. And so this gives rise to what we call the helical MRI, which is actually an overstability uh, which was discovered in 2005 and got everyone all excited because it seems like a great prospect for detecting in the lab. Um, it's at a more, or it can be excited at a more favorable Reynolds number to have in your laboratory. Um, and so we are going to look at helical MRI as well. Oh, and I should say there's actually been a detection, or depending on who you ask, a claimed detection um, of the helical MRI in the laboratory, whereas we have yet to see standard MRI. So, uh Princeton yes. Plasma Lab is doing this. Who else is doing it in the world? Uh, the Promise Experiment in Dresden is who saw the, uh, or Potsdam. The Promise Experiment or Promise? Promise? Oh, it's acronym is Promise. Okay, yeah, good. yeah. Very good acronym. It's in uh, Potsdam. Potsdam, Germany. Yes, so they're the ones that detected um, helical MRI. There's also an experiment in Maryland, everyone just calls it the Maryland experiment, that claimed to detect standard MRI, but uh, they definitely saw other flows. So this is now a big industry. Too. Yeah, there are a couple, there's also a group in Wisconsin that uh, may be going after this and, as well. Can I go back to, uh, uh, I guess I know a little bit about the shearing box things, but um, a, a way to approach the problem would be to make it an adaptive simulation mm -hmm. so that in effect 
the shearing boundary conditions are being determined with feedback. Yes. Is that being done? That is being done. Yeah, I did not at all do justice to all of the adaptations of the shearing box that people are developing now. There are also shearing boxes now uh, that are radially local, but um, vertically global, which is important if you want to do any sort of stratification in a disk. Um, there are all sorts of, all sorts of adaptations. Does it confirm some of the results from the uh, fixed the shear, shearing boundary conditions, it's, or does it call it into question? There are still um, inconsistencies that appear, especially at sort of intermediate scales, um, that people are still fighting about and working out. It's not an easy problem. And a lot of this, of course, depends on exactly what disk conditions you're going after. Um, so, all right, so these are the three uh, sort of types or, or geometries of MRI um, that we look at. So I'll just very, very briefly explain what weekly nonlinear analysis is. Basically, we're working in the regime where our system is only weakly unstable to the most unstable mode of the linear solution. So we identify some most unstable mode as a function of uh, the parameters of the system. And um, if you define some critical, let's say, magnetic Reynolds number and critical wavelength, um, here we're looking at Um, the growth rate as a function of wave number. So at our critical wave number, um, the growth rate of the system is exactly zero. So this is the most unstable mode at marginality. The growth rate is sigma, right? And so what we do in weekly nonlinear analysis is tune this most unstable mode just over the threshold of instability. And we do that by tuning the magnetic field down an amount that's parameterized by some small parameter epsilon. So remember that if we were to strengthen the magnetic field, we would stabilize against the MRI. So instead, we're going to weaken the magnetic field just a little bit so that we destabilize this band of wave modes uh, of order epsilon, which can now interact nonlinearly. We're also conducting a multiple scales analysis which means that we're tracking the evolution of our variables on both fast and slow time scales. So uh, we have some long or slow variation uh, in the vertical dimension and also in time, and also, of course, fast variation. And we, we encode all of this in some onsets where we're solving for an amplitude function um, and we're also solving the small scale radial dependence on our grid subject to our boundary conditions. And we go ahead and just posit vertical periodicity because remember, we're assuming that our cylinder is infinitely long. So is this um, sort of single boat dominance with that small epsilon variation? Or in other words, um, treat this as a truncated um, expansion and get the essence? Yeah, that's, that's exactly what happens. Well, what so we do a perturbation expansion from this. Uh -huh. yeah. And um, so the ODE, so it's ODEs. BDEs. Yeah. Partial differential equations. Yep. Um, and then we solve the radial dimension um, using this pseudo-spectral code called Daedalus, um, which Jeff is one of the developers for, and I definitely encourage everyone to check out this is open source, written in Python. Um, so we're conducting a weekly nonlinear, multi-scale perturbation analysis in a very formal way. Um, and if anyone here is an expert, um, we are uh, removing secular terms at each order by enforcing solvability criteria. So we solve up to third order to close the system at second order. So the result of all of this is an amplitude equation for that most unstable mode. So I have a little cartoon of alpha, right? That's the slowly varying amplitude equation. 
And you can see this equation has a linear growth term, has a diffusion term, has some nonlinear term. This is part of a class of equations called a Ginzburg-Landau equation, or GLE. This appears in a whole variety of physical systems. Um, and is extremely well studied, maybe the most well studied equation in physics. Maybe that's extreme hyperbole, I'm not sure. <laughs> but extremely, extremely well studied. And what we find, it's very interesting, is that the nature of the amplitude equation that we derive depends on the background magnetic field that we have initialized. Specifically, the coefficients of this GLE are all real when we initialize just a vertical field and are complex when we initialize a helical field. And this is significant because the, the, the character of what we call the complex GLE, rather than the real GLE, um, is subject to instabilities of its own. And so what this means is that the helical MRI may be unstable, like its saturated state may be unstable, um, and it may show variability on long scales, long length and time scales. So this could be significant because in uh, the game of finding MRI in your liquid metal experiment, really half or more of the battle is just knowing exactly what it is that you're looking for because you're trying to see that signal underneath other flows that your uh, rotating cylinders are driving. So we can also look at the saturated state of everything um, at separate orders in our preservation series. And we do this for thin gap, wide gap, uh, and helical MRI. So if we just go back to the equation for a second, uh, it's really neat that uh, to this, uh, yes. Uh, but one of the essences of that is that the alpha squared, which is like it's coming from a, a, some kind of effective potential, mm -hmm. um, is being evaluated uh, without longer range uh, interaction. Right. So is that, um, it, it, was there an approximation that got to that, or does that just pop out? Um. Well, you know, I mean, when you have a turbulent kind of situation, then um, this scale talks to this scale, talks to this scale, talks to this scale. So one might have wondered whether um, the essence would have uh, more scales involved than just something which is acting at the point, which is what kind of this scale. So uh, there are interactions between, basically what's happening is uh, the nonlinear terms come from interactions between different orders in your perturbation series. So as we expand first order, second order, now those terms can interact with one another and that gives us our nonlinear behavior. So that's where that's coming from. Yeah. Um, we're almost done. Um, and this is just briefly, it's sort of a silly little animation just to show that um, I'm always plotting these things in two dimensions because we, we perturb axisymmetrically, and so everything is in the radial vertical dimension. But of course, it's actually happening in three dimensions. <coughs> and so these nice sort of patterns, these two-dimensional roles that we're deriving um, as part of this pattern-forming system are actually more complicated uh, paths. This is showing the uh, second order and first order velocity perturbations. They're more complicated, of course, in three dimensions. And in all of these cases, we are finding that the MRI saturates in this paradigm by reducing or posing the background shear. Um, so it's, it's cutting off um, the free energy that it gets from the differential rotation. All right, so um, we now have a robust analytical framework for solving MRI systems up to second order perturbations. Um, we're going to submit this very soon and then hopefully make all of this code public in addition, obviously, to all of the published math um, so that other people can play with and expand on the system. Um, and one thing I'm highlighting today is that the saturated state of the weakly nonlinear MRI may be unstable for uh, an initial helical field. Thank you.
uh, an anisotropic field, Q of U, which depend upon NH1. Uh, and yet, the analysis you were giving didn't make use of that information. Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, there are correlations which are non-trivial, and yes. presumably that would really add to the story. Yeah, absolutely. Um, the, when I was showing the um, sort of Bayesian combination of the H1 and the Planck data, that could absolutely happen with a third dimension that is polarized intensity, yeah. or intensity, and uh, the prior from the H1 side could be the constant. So yeah, yeah. That is in the future. But absolutely possible, you're right, yeah. Um, so, you said at the end that the uh, saturation of the MRI occurs by uh, <coughs> reducing the shear off of which the MRI needs. But how does that work in practice when you have these, um, the constraint of a given delta V across the inner and outer battery conditions or on an accretion disk, presumably, of roughly Kepler. Right. Uh, so it, it doesn't sound possible to eliminate the shear everywhere. That's right. And if you eliminate it one place, you build it up somewhere else. So what, what exactly is that? So, so OK. Uh, a saturation mechanism of purely reducing the shear beyond the point where you could excite MRI is, is almost certainly impossible in a capillarian disk where the rotation profile is enforced by gravity. Um, that's not to say that that couldn't still occur in some regions of disks um, or that that couldn't play a significant role in addition to some other mechanism that's turning off the MRI. Um, so this is what we're deriving is relevant for the liquid metal experiments. And so we're saying that that's how they are going to saturate. Um, but that is just one so piece of the. Cylinders are rotating at some difference in velocity. So where is that difference? Velocity? That's right. But they still have the uh, flow still has a freedom to um, oppose that shear. So uh, we should have actually plotted. I you can't. Get rid of it, right? you can't can't get rid of it, but you can you can uh, redistribute it um, into something that's much less able to excite MRI. Yeah. Can I ask a question? Mm -hmm. The last animation you had just a few slides ago. Yeah. Can you explain that again? I, this? I think I missed the essential point. What are these? Oh yeah, sure. Oh yeah. So basically, I am just dropping tracer particles into the first and second order of velocity perturbation field um, and watching where they go. And they are sort of glowing brighter when they move faster. Um, so that's dropping this cylinder, basically. Right. So this is just the point was that I'm always talking about this domain. Of course, this is only part of a, an annulus that goes the whole way around the cylinder. Um, and you can also see sort of, um, you see them sort of zipping around in the, uh, on the walls of this domain. And that's coming from the more significant velocity kicks that you get in the boundary layers. You get pretty significant boundary layers in this um, setup. Great. Okay, I think that's it. Um, I think we'll go upstairs. Okay, conversation up there.